year was that we did that 10 years ago oh my god so good afternoon good morning good <laughs> evening depending on where you are on this fast forward planet sadly still wrapped in a pandemic uh it doesn't feel like that in some chunks of the United States that are doing very well with the vaccine and it's distancing still. I put on my mask when I went to the market just now. And other parts are horrifically still out of control. Delta, Delta, Delta. And the world is still largely unvaccinated. You know, most of the planet is still unvaccinated. So pandemic, the idea of getting over the pandemic is got to get, we have to get over the idea of getting over the pandemic. Um, it's an overheating planet and the infra information environment is overheated and deadlocked and polarized and full of monstrous uh, algorithms, uh, including at, Asia, at Facebook, uh, which is supporting my Revkin.Bulletin.com uh, effort to, to inject rational and trustworthy co uh, content into that, that arena. So we're, we're in a troubled time. And that's why I thought it's worth, I guess we should do this fairly frequently, Randy, uh, circling back to Randy Olson, who has been carving a journey um, around communication now for a quarter century, building out of a career in marine biology, initially uh, up here in the Northeast where I am. Uh, and then he moved to LA, got a film degree, started making films. Uh, the first one of which I, I really noticed was Sizzle, even though he'd already done Flock of Dodos on creationism craziness. Um, and since then he's become a real master in evangelist for breaking the old mold of science communication, uh, moldy mold. <laughs> and I'm not going to waste more time introducing him because he's got a manifesto bringing himself forward in a new way that he's going to present here uh, today for you. Uh, Randy, I understand you went surfing this morning out there on the north of LA in Malibu and and I congratulate you always for living a life that includes communing with the sea that way so regularly. And so I assume you're doing really well this morning. Uh, yeah, I got to get that uh, good way to start the day. Got a great swell coming in. So got to grab the waves while you can. Swell, swell. Good. Swell, swell. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, you said you were encouraging me to call this show, Is Science Communication Worse Than It Was 100 Years Ago? Can Simplicity Help? Um and I, you know, I've got all kinds of questions around both of those questions, but it's the message. So, what, what is it? What, what has, what's been driving your, your thinking most recently? Uh, are we ready to dive into my highly sophisticated graphics presentation? Yeah, I think we should. You know, we did one little PowerPointy thing here once, uh, once upon a time before your last apartment burned down in the fire, uh, and you had created a really sophisticated presentation and we're going to go at it again. And then we'll get into some of the things you're doing um, and where do we go from here, but take us yeah. down before we come up. Okay. And you know, what, what an apartment member, it was a little cottage on the cliff that you came and visited. You stayed there. Uh, like yeah, I know. Yeah, that was fun. Um, all right. So let's see, I put together this really high budget, sophisticated graphics presentation <laughs> to go with what I have to say. And I think you and I talked about we're going to split this session overall into two halves. The first half, I'll talk about problems in communication science and communication in general. And then the second half, we'll get into solutions and stuff that I'm doing that I hope will be of some value. So um, the addressing problem, I'm going to talk for about 10 minutes here. And this is kind of like a little semi science fiction presentation I put together for you. So imagine a world in which the science community in 1969 had identified science fiction writer Michael Crichton as collaboration target number one. Imagine that the leaders of the science world came together and they realized that he had this best-selling book, The Andromeda Strain, in 1969, got turned into a hugely popular movie, uh, but he was still in the science world. He had done his medical degree at Harvard University, his residency at Mass General. He was a postdoc at the Salk Institute in La Jolla. So clearly he was bilingual, more so than anybody ever in the history of the planet, really. There's never been anybody who's had as deep a credentials in the science world and then as overwhelming credentials in the media world. You know, by 1994, he became the first individual to ever have the simultaneous number one book, movie and TV show. Um, that no, one, no one had done that before. He was a towering presence, both physically, he was six foot nine, and also in terms of his 
dominating the media world and understanding how media works. So he was a resource out there. And by the you know mid 60s, the people had started to realize that we were turning into a media driven society and that there was a dark side to this media. People like Edward R. Murrow, the famous journalist who had shown his chops in World War II and come back and help create the news division at CBS News, headed up by William Paley. Um, in David Halberstam's brilliant book, The Powers That Be, he told the whole story of what went on with Edward R. Murrow, which was that he had his glory days there with the McCarthy hearings. But by the late 50s and early 60s, began to run into this horrible realization, which is that his beloved CBS News division was less popular on TV than comedies that started to emerge like The Munsters, Gilligan's Island, Beverly Hills, literally. He was baffled and he died in 1965, bitter and depressed, going to his grave like, what the hell happened? I thought we created this great resource for this country. And it turns out most of the people would rather watch Beverly Hillbillies. Um, at the same time, media visionary Marshall McLuhan coined his term, the medium is the message. He began to realize that this media stuff was so dominating and so important. And so had the science world listened to that and come to a realization and then taken a look at this guy, Crichton, they might have seen this huge opportunity. And over the next 25 years, they could have formed a partnership with him and he could have worked with them and helped the science world communicate these serious and important issues. And by 1998, um, when climate scientist, not trained communicator, but climate scientist, Dr. Michael Mann at Penn State University co-authored his paper on the hockey stick model, bringing first really major attention to what was going on with the climate, uh, Crichton could have partnered with him and put together a big budget action movie similar to Jurassic Park that had come out in 93, which really educated the masses on dinosaurs and helped call so much public attention to di dinosaurs as a topic. They could have done the same thing with climate. Uh, that didn't happen. Instead, what did happen was the lame brain action movie, The Day After Tomorrow, that came out in 2004. <laughs> And even that cockamamie movie, Tony Lazarowitz at Yale, showed that it did have at least a little bit of a bene benefit to society. It, um, it's hard to remember how much people back then thought it was laughable, the idea that we could alter our atmosphere. But that movie helped with that simple notion. Um, and had there been that partnership with Cri Crichton, he could have made a movie that would have been characterized by the same sort of accurate science that characterized all of the work that he did. Jurassic Park, all of those things. They were his imagination put to work, but it was always built on true accurate science. He could have done the same thing for climate. That could have happened. Last year, I published an editorial in Encia about this called The Lost Opportunity. And of course, the science world doesn't want to hear any sort of critical analysis from the past, anything like that. And as a result, it was largely dismissed, like just like they did with Crichton. Um, and that's what happened. So Crichton never was sought out as a collaborator. He was um, just kind of stared at as a, some curiosity, some clown from Hollywood. And then eventually um, he ended up just being sort of alienated, almost ostracized by the, the science community. And then as he began to ask questions about the climate models in the late 90s, then the, the rivalry, the bitterness began to develop. And it is absolutely a fact that by 2004, he had become an enemy of science. His book, state of fear was was terrible you know it was a terrible work it was an anti-science work it was an anti-environmental work there's no excuses for that and when i um when i was making my movie sizzle in 2007 a year before he died i spent four months trading emails with him about this stuff and the things that he was saying about climate science by then were you know kind of borderline off the deep end i think but before he went off the deep end he was there as a resource. There's no denying that. And keeping those two things separate, I mean, it's kind of like Newton who got into alchemy, but nobody uses that to dismiss Newtonian physics. You can separate these things. Um, so the science world didn't partner with Crichton. Instead, what we have today um, are major voices for science like Bill Nye and Neil deGrasse Tyson and Alan Alda, and they are wonderful. Um, they are wonderful, one-dimensional voices for science in which they embody only the message that science is wonderful, it's great, it's awesome, every kid in the world ought to become a scientist, and if we can make that happen, mm -hmm. then we can save everything in our society. And that's a part of the overall agenda, but whatever happened to cautionary tales? What happened to these previous generations in which there was almost a feeling of responsibility to society to tell these cautionary tales? The idea that every advance of science brings with it a dark side. 
there were lots of them in the, the past, you know, not just Michael Crichton. All of his work was characterized by that. Stephen Jay Gould, I had the good fortune to spend mm. time around as a graduate student. All of his writings in evolution were all warning people, look out, scientists are only human. You see it through his 25 years of his column with Natural History magazine and all of his, his essays and books, Mismeasure of Man. They're all warning about watch out for the science world because they can do great things for us. But there's a dark side. Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, even Carl Sagan, they all offered up these cautionary tales. And Crichton in particular was, was consumed with that. You know, he used to talk about how with every new invention, with, with the advent of trains came these horrifying train wrecks. With the advent of cars came things people had never seen with car wrecks. With the advent, with the advent of technology, what do we got going there? A truck. There? Okay. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> With the advent of trucks, we get <laughs> the sound intrusion on <laughs> podcasts. Um, and with the advent of the internet, we got social media and Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook and all these things that go haywire. So it's so important. Um, you know, there is at least boutique voices like Black Mirror from the UK that are some cautionary tales, but not like the previous generation. Instead, what we have today now is just cheering for science. Yay, science. Science is wonderful. It's the sa savior of everything. Now, I mentioned Marshall McLuhan. Um, he died in 1980. And in his final years, he got consumed with something that he called the information maelstrom. And that's drawing from Edgar Allan Poe's famous poem about the maelstrom, the idea of this vortex where everything gets sucked in and it turns into just complete swirling chaos and oblivion. He saw that for the future. And interestingly, you know, this is before the information explosion took place in the 80s. So before that even really had hit, he already sensed it in the 70s. We're heading some, towards something really dark and ominous, the information maelstrom. Uh, he just didn't live to see it. And that's where we are today. We're in the information maelstrom. There's just no denying that. And you can see it in the science world. You can see it in the plague of false positives. This is well documented in the biomedical world, the idea that uh, John Ioannidis had said in 2005 that today the majority of uh, biomedical papers published are false positives. And there's been, you know, tons and tons of examination of that. Um, you, in this world of too much information now, academics are just pouring gasoline on the fire. They continue to just spew out mountains and mountains of information and new journals and new ways to parse things all the way down. And the science world for communication has brought in all of this thinking from psychology, where they're now talking about cognition and values and framing and trying how many different ways can we define framing? And it's just all, you know, kind of stamp collecting, trying to figure out how many different varieties of everything can we identify. And in the middle of all that ends up with this problem of obfuscation, uh, the idea of having concepts that people could understand if only presented to them in a clear enough, simple enough manner. And interestingly, Michael Crichton in 1975, wrote a, a brilliant short paper in the New England Journal of Medicine titled Medical Obfuscation Structure and Function. And what he did was he took three papers out of the New England Journal of Medicine, put together a list of the 10 most common characteristics in the writing style that resulted in obfuscation, the communication in too confused and contorted of a manner for average people to really understand it. And in the discussion of that short little paper, you know, he said several brilliant things, one of which was this idea that 100 years ago, scientists and doctors did communicate more clearly. There was less information. People could think more clearly. They could pull their thoughts together in a better way. They didn't engage in obfuscation. He said verbatim, only in the 20th century has obfuscation become an accepted practice for communication. So there's your basic enemy. And where we are now in the information maelstrom is a situation in which now Honest to goodness, anti-science is now getting an equal and uh, equally powerful voice with science. We've seen it in the pandemic in the last year and a half. I, you know, I did what I could. In 2006, I made a movie called Flock of Dodos in which I had a number of anti-science voices in the movie. And two years later, I made another movie, Sizzle of Global Warming Comedy. You moderated the panel discussion at the premiere of that movie at the Woods Hole Film Festival. I had to sit there in public on panel discussions and be insulted humiliated by scientists on these panels who called the movie disgraceful, insulting, that I was helping the enemy by putting them. I had Fred Singer in there and I had Pat Michaels and I had Mark Morano, the, the most prominent um, anti-science voices in the climate issue. And six years later, Robbie Kenner made a movie um, version of Naomi Oreskes' book, um, Merchants of Doubt. 
that was funded by participant. And he came to me for input. I told him to put Morano in there. He did. Morano stole the show. You can see in the reviews, a lot of them say Morano was the best character in there. There was no attack on him for how dare you give screen time to the, the enemy. But for me, six years earlier, there absolutely was. And, you know, the movie just got insulted by scientists on their blogs. And it also got the only really rotten review in my entire 30-year film career the, career. the only person who ever felt the need to rip something I'd done to pieces was Nature. Hired one of their writers to write a rotten review of that movie called Climate Comedy Falls Flat. And all through it, just basically, you know, just tore it to pieces. It had consequences for me. There were a number of universities that were working on invitations for me to come and screen the movie and pay me a screening fee. And they canceled it based on this rotten review in nature. And that's what you get from the science world. When you try and do something creative and different like that, you end up with a film that got great reviews in Variety and Hollywood Reporter. And we had over 100 screenings with audiences roaring with laughter, enjoying it, and then thinking deeply. And we got to the second part of it, as you saw when you moderated that discussion. Uh, but when you get to that central voice of the world of science, it's it's very negating, dismissive. And, you know, it's the voice that voted Carl Sagan down um, for his admission to the National Academy of Sciences. And when you read the biographies of Carl Sagan, you can read the quotes from his former wife, Lynn Margulis, who was there for the vote and reported back to him and said, you were voted down out of sheer bitterness and jealousy from your colleagues who just really resented the attention you got as a, in the popularization of science. So. There you go. Um, that's the state of the problem now. We're in the information maelstrom. What has gone on with the pandemic is an utter and complete disaster. I mean, it really, really is. And, you know, as always with science, there's two challenges. There's the doing of the science, and then there's communicating it and effectuating it, putting it into action. With the pandemic, they, of course, did a brilliant job with the doing of it. They put together Biden's advisory team, 16 largely epidemiologists who helped power drive the whole idea of developing the vaccines and they massively succeeded. But when it came to the second part of the communication thing, they hit you know brick walls and they ended up with a third of the population turning against the vaccine. And only one epidemiologist in the media that I've seen to date has really spoken out about the failure of communication. That's Dr. Michael Osterholm at University of Minnesota. A year ago right now, he was on Meet the Press and he talked about that. He said, we're failing to communicate in a singular voice. We're failing to use the power of story and storytelling. I heard that, jumped out of my chair, got in through my contacts at CDC, and he and I instantly started going, uh, working together. I helped him for about four months on his podcast and helped me write parts of that during uh, December and January and February when it was at the worst of the, the surge there, and, and now continue to talk to him on, you know, the, every few days we trade emails and talk about the whole thing. Again, he's the only one that's really identified that as a problem. All the rest of the epidemiology world seems to think that, well, you know, communication, that's the easy part. We've just got to get the the breakthroughs and there you have it so there's the statement yeah. of the problem for today yeah so um there's a couple of things i want to ask you about you you mentioned how uh, ed, ed morrow got uh bummed out yeah. by all the other stuff swamping him and i just yesterday ran into a long time 60 minutes producer who uh, is retired now he actually he's doing that years of living dangerously stuff david gilber and mm -hmm. it reminded me of 60 minutes for some anomalous reason is this hugely successful commercial uh, operation that does a lot of science too. You know, uh, is that an anomaly? Is that would Ed no, not by any have No, no, I, I can explain to you um, exactly, you know, what's at the core of their success. And it's, it's this, um, this narrative structure. Right. Six minutes is the model for narrative structure. They figured out early on, they have just incredibly good storytelling skills and I got to be buddies three or four years ago with Chapman Downs, longtime producer of HBO Real Sports. He did a great segment on climate change. And I wrote a rave review on my blog about that, which somebody forwarded to him. And next thing you know, he and I are on the phone and I had him as a guest in the, my course last year. He's an awesome guy. But, you know, I asked him, what's the secret of that wonderful program? And I think it's one of the best pieces of programming TV. And he said, oh, it's very simple. We just copied the 60 minutes model. You know, there you go. You just tell good stories. And interestingly, with HBO Real Sports, um, in quizzing him, I said, so I'm, gonna, I'm guessing that you've got this whole worldwide network, you know, of about 25 people that are searching the world for all these stories that you do, because they do incredible stories from other countries as well on HBO Real Sports. And he said, no, to, to the contrary, people are always stunned at what a small operation we are here. The only major resource they have is a team of four or five producers who have been there for 20 years and have deep 
narrative intuition. That's what's at the core of effective communication is people who've got the brains that are shaped where they can spot the stories, they can develop the stories, they can turn them into powerful right. stories and translate into what they do with that. And that's such a good show. But again, it's just copied from 60 Minutes. And and I think what you, it's worth uh, reminding people what you think of when you think of that, that what makes a great story or a great presentation of it. It's there is that and ABT phenomenon. Could you just give a thumbnail? Reminder. Well, that starts to move that. into, as I said, um, talking about solutions. And yeah, I don't know what the absolute solution is. You know, nothing's going to change overnight. We, we've created this mess. And again, we've created um, so much science technology that's had a dark side that wasn't understood. And then so much information that we're just awash in it. So none of these things are going to get solved overnight. And even good ideas can look ineffective in the short term because they take a while to implement. But you can't help but think the very thing that that Crichton identified in 75. I mean, if if I were president of this country, I would force every citizen to read that three page note that he wrote in 75 in the New England Journal of Medicine. There it is. There was the marching orders for the entire science world. Yeah, that's my old essay I did last year. Um, right. It's just been lost to the ravages of time. And here is here's the freaking conundrum with this communication stuff that is mind blowing. The more that it's just really settled in on the last, in the last few weeks on me, which is that the, the it, in the course that I, I teach right now in the ABT framework, if I were to put together a textbook, it would only be about 12 pages. There's about four or five articles that we use over and over and over again. And they're all super short. Why? Because they were written by great communicators and great communicators know how to boil their message down to something really short and get it out there. Um, so Crichton's thing was only three pages. It was a note in the New England Journal of Medicine. And you know what happens with scientists. I wrote about it in the second chapter of my first book, Don't Be So Literal Minded. They're so literal minded. They look at a three page note and say, well, I guess there's not much there. You know, why would we bother talking about that thing? And you want the proof of that. Take a look at Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which has zero practical side to it. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Great that he's got the Nobel Prize. Great that he wrote that book. And you will see so many people involved in science communication that have a copy of that book and they think, oh, man, th this is the Bible. It's not. It's not usable. It's not functional. It's not readable. It's a massively intellectual treatment of this stuff characterized right off the bat by calling the two things system one and system two. That's not intuitive at all. You know, mm -hmm. cerebral and visceral, that's intuitive. People can use that and actually right. put it to work in the real world. System one, system two. It's, it's actually the same thing as right brain, left brain. You know, can anybody ever remember which is which? Those things are put together by analytical minds. They're, they're great for the academic world. They're not functional in the real world. And so there's the conundrum is that there are these four or so papers that I would use if I put together textbooks, starting with Crichton's simple little note, identifying the problem, obfuscation. We need to bond together and start to work on this obfuscation problem. Second thing I would put in there is the brilliant three-page article from Nicholas Kristof in, of all places, Outside Magazine in 2009. And, you know, remember, Andy, you, you set me up for a little chat with him when I was writing the Houston book, and, and I brought that article up with him, and he said, you wouldn't believe how many people, you know, cite that article. Um, and yet it's lost also in the ravages of time. It's just not taken seriously. And yet the knowledge, the amount of knowledge per word in that article is just unbelievable. And he goes yeah, to, what's that? You just reminded me of something, Ed, Ed, Ed Wilson, you know, one of the great scientists of all time. Sure. I was with him one day a year or two ago. He said his novel that he wrote has sold far more copies than all of his books combined. <laughs> and that, what does that say about narrative? I haven't yeah. read the novel, but but there's something about, Absolutely. again, the story as opposed to substance that oh, yeah. even he recognizes. I do think, I think, believe it or not, Bill McKibben was recently, he's writing a second novel i guess along with his all of his books i think i saw on twitter or on his Substack thing he said i, I doubt it sold as much as end of nature but i think yeah. it's so better than well you can go back and forth on that because yes the the novel will reach a much bigger broader audience but then you can ask the deeper question of, yeah it's great everybody read it did it really impact them did they, it really cause any change in their thinking or who knows what so there's multiple dimensions to that well and that's you know in my elder years, I have been focused more and more on what the hell actually matters. Uh, I think I mentioned to you that the, uh, you know, the warming stripes, this pattern of showing 150 years of global temperature, it's like 
bluish stripes going to red, 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 hot. Mm -hmm. Right, right. It's all over the place now. It was on the cover of The Economist. It's on the sides of trucks. It's in the banners at uh, COP26. And uh, and I, I ran a show on, is it doing anything? And with a young a PhD candidate who studies art, the interface between art and, and science and response. And no one has a clue. <laughs> at the very least, no one knows. Uh, and, and I would say that that is probably a pretty good hypothesis that, um, it, you know, it, it kind of engages people they they like it yeah do they you know, well, do this, but we it's know, a changing behavior what we know in mass communication is that um simplicity is a major powerful attribute and you know look at slogans look for big corporations and their slogans they don't have paragraphs of text about their product they have these short little slogans that everybody can connect with and hopefully the slogan embodies bodies something about them ideally and that's the same thing i'm saying about this science communication stuff is that again if i had a textbook it would only be about 12 pages long because this is what i've come to realize all of these really powerful well-written articles they're not very long and if something is long this is the irony that i've said is that michael crichton's brilliant thing on obfuscation in 1975 buried in the new england journal of medicine had he written an 800 page tome about the need for concision, which in itself would be a contradiction in terms, but it would still be sold. And by the way, you know, two guys who, who really, I think they deserve a reverse Pulitzer Prize 10 years later. Um, these two journalists from the Wall Street Journal published this book about 10 years ago, The One Thing. And it is still, you take, you know, what, look at this, a number one bestseller, yada, yada. It's still really high up there on Amazon sales rank. This book is the only really thing valuable in this book is right. What you're looking at there, the cover, the one thing that's super important to understand. This is the power of the singular narrative. The singular narrative goes as deep as all the way back to Gilgamesh. You know, it's 4,000 years yeah. of cultural evolution and Robert McKee and his principles of, of classical design and art plot. That's the first characteristic is that the stories that resonate and persist in time and space are the ones that have got the singular one protagonist, the one character who's on a journey to solve a problem. The one thing, that's what their book is about, the one thing. And these guys had the brilliance and insight to know that rather than take their minimal piece of content here and write it up as an editorial in the Wall Street Journal that never would have been remembered, would have just fallen by the wayside, they expanded out to a 240 page book that is just saying the same thing over there. One thing, one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing. And as a result, 10 years <laughs> later, people still buy the book. That's very smart of them. I wish that Crichton would have written an 800 page book about the need to be concise. There's the fundamental <laughs> problem because the scientists don't take anything serious. If it, and, and let me tell you one little anecdote. Once upon a time when I was a graduate student, I met with a professor who will go unnamed. He had just come back from the dissertation meeting of a brilliant graduate student in molecular genetics and that student had published three papers two in nature and one in science as a phd graduate student and this professor i was in his office and he was holding up the guy's phd dissertation and it was 12 pages it was this tiny thin little thing all he did was staple his three papers together the two nature papers and the science paper and say i'm done and his advisor joined him in pride and said that's all we need you get your phd and this professor sat there holding that thing up that day and saying, this just isn't, this is not a dissertation. You know, I'm being forced to mm -hmm. sign off on this thing because they're all so proud of him. But if you ask me, I think he needs to go back and do this, this, and this. And this particular professor, his dissertation, which I knew all too well, was over a thousand pages, this great big massive two volume tome that he, you know, he lived his life by. And that's, you know, that's typological thinking, as Ernst Meyer, the great evolutionist, always talked about. It's this idea that you're so constrained in your vision of, of the world that if things don't fit into your pre-described little vision of how it all is, then you can't even broaden out and, and see it as, as something fitting the same label. But that absolutely was a dissertation. When the guy publishes two papers in Nature and one in Science that are, you know, groundbreaking and paradigm shifting, that's all you should need. And so it's back to the same thing with these most important papers in communication, unfortunately, are very short. And that's the way it goes. And towards that end, actually, um, you know, while we're on the subject, that's what I did this last year, which is once upon a time, I published this thing with the University of Chicago Press 2015. Right. used to have a narrative, the academic book with the academic press, which is nice. I'm not sure I would recommend spending your late night hours reading this thing, but this is the book that I ended up writing last fall from our course. 
And right. when the pandemic hit, we had to end. Um, in this book, I sketched out the idea of narrative training and we set to work developing the model for five years. Um, the, the form that we developed for five years is called Story Circles. And that was great. It had its own attributes, things like that. Mm -hmm. When the pandemic hit in the beginning of last year, we couldn't do those events. And uh, they were always live. The demo days involved 40 people in a room. So we had to shift our little model. And we took a shot at this new Zoom world that people were talking about and put together a course and instantly filled up 50 slots. And now cut to a year and a half later, we're now in the 17th round. We're finishing this week. Next Tuesday, we'll start the 18th round. We've had just about a oh, dozen or so major organizations. Uh, National Park Service in particular has probably been a partner in seven or eight or nine rounds. They will be next week. Um, they we've had a whole bunch of different organizations. It's wonderful. And out of that, we began iterating this course. And here's the fascinating thing is that, you know, if you develop a course at a university, you probably only teach it once a year, maybe twice, you know, if you do it every semester. But if it's only once a year, that means to iterate it 17 times, it's going to take you 17 years. And you know that courses get better as people teach them over and over again. You know, you eventually get with this professor who's got a course that's been shaped and honed over the ages. This course that we put together is 10 one-hour sessions. It usually fits within one month, uh, usually every Tuesday, Thursday. And we've done it 17 times. And there's about 15 sort of faculty that helped me run it. And after every single session, we have a conference call and we get on the conference call and whoever was there today in the session, usually four or five or six people, we just have a chat of what went on today. And in those conference calls, if you do the math on that, 17 times, 170 conference calls, at least that we've had in the past year and a half, as we've incubated this thing and cracked the nuts and solved the puzzles to make this course tighter and tighter and tighter to the point now where it's a really well oiled machine. The 10 sessions consist of, I do the first four that are nuts and bolts. Then there are five, quote, guest lectures, five other people that give their sessions. And each of them has shaped theirs over time. And now the course, um, well, it ended up by last fall, it produced this three-step model for the strengthening of an ABT. And that's what's in the book here. This page says um, the ABT three-step uh, development model. And that is the core of the book. The core of the course now is this three-step model. Uh, boop, 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 there. Oops. Yeah. And that's what we, we work on now. And then as we do this, um, what goes with the course is every section, the first half hour is, is lecture. Second half hour is interactive. We do a thing called the ABT build, where each person has their one sentence and but therefore statement of their project. They present it to the whole course. And then we set to work for about usually seven or eight minutes with me poking and prodding, asking questions, you know, what about this? Well, look what you've gotten to there for. Don't you think that would work better up front in the, in the opening here? What about, you know, your problem looks like you've got multiple narratives here going on the butt thing. All these basic rules that we've discerned about the ABT framework, the dynamic. And then while we're doing that, the cool thing is everybody else in the course is in the chat window also taking shots at suge uh, suggestions and how this could work. Um, and as a result of that now, I've done over 500 of these ABT build sessions. And it's out of that iteration. That's how you develop intuition is through iteration. And this is what's missing at most universities. And, and feedback. And, and feedback, exactly. Shaping, yeah. shaping, shaping. And this thing has gotten tighter and tighter and tighter. And the result of that now is the next iteration, which is our business guys. So the, these five people that teach the course with me that, that do the core uh, sessions, the first one is Patricia Limerick, MacArthur fellow historian who instantly saw the value of the ABT in the world of history. She's now propagating, it, propagating that direction. Second is Brian Palermo, improv actor. Third is Park Howell um, from the business world, the host of the podcast, uh, the, the Business of Story, where he's, I think he's approaching 400 episodes in that. And then two scientists, Dan Diana Padilla and Nancy Knowlton. And both of them were both... Um, fellows in the Aldo Leopold program 20 years ago, then like the first right. year to did that. And I think something happened there where they got taught listening and opened their minds up to understand that, you know, you want to get better communication. Listening is the most important thing. You've got to listen to things. And both of them are longtime buddies of mine. Diana and I were undergraduates together. Nancy Knowlton, I've, I've known she and Jeremy for over 40 years. You've, you've known them for a long time too. Um, she's Nancy's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And I invited them last year in the very first session just to listen in. And both of them, of all the crazy things, both of them heard things from the business guy, Park Howell, 
that resonated with them. Like, oh my God, right. this is the same stuff we do in science. So in Diana's case, she listened to Park talk about the idea that you're not the hero of your story. The client, the customer is the hero. And it's the same thing in writing research proposals. You know, you don't write a search proposal about I'm the greatest scientist ever. You look at the, the, the hero is the science community that's trying to solve some problem and you try and slot yourself into there. And then Park also has this thing, the narrative spiral. And Nancy heard that and said, oh, my God, that's the same thing as the history of the American environmental movement. And so she put together her whole session around that. Um, Park, at the beginning of this year, after I did this thing, which is now kind of the textbook for the course, the narrative gym, and you can see that on Amazon, uh, Park came to me and said, you know what? Great book, but my business people aren't going to buy something written by a scientist. Is there any chance we could put the same book out, but with the word business on the cover? And lo and behold, that's what we did. The special business uh, version for the business community. He and I did a little bit of rewriting it. He added in business content. Now I'm working with a fellow named Doug Passon, who's been teaching storytelling for lawyers for more than a decade. He came across the ABT three years ago, and now he uses it in all of his training. And he came to uh, to Park first and then me about two months ago with that idea. He says, is there any chance you guys might want to collaborate on a book about the ABT for the, the legal world? Because this is exactly the tool that we need. And well, yeah, let's do the same thing. Let's take yeah. this and do the law version. So now Doug and I just spent this whole weekend, these massive discussions as we're rewriting it into the legal world. The next after that will be Patty Limerick with the history world. The next after that will be um, Nancy Nolan into environment. And then hopefully the one for the political world in which the collaborator there, uh, I can't announce yet, but I'm doing delicate negotiations to get just the right guy a long time. Go, go for Carville. I know. Uh, I know yeah, I, 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 I don't want to talk about anything. Too yeah. Soon. Um, yeah. All right. I want to, I want to uh, pause here to sure. get into a couple of particulars. Uh, one is getting back to that concept of the information maelstrom that we are all totally in. Yeah. Um, you know, some tiny fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the inf information world is listening to us right now. <laughs> and um, so what it sounds to me like the first step and what Park's wise comment about you're not the hero of your own narrative, the customer is the first step in is ignoring the maelstrom or finding a, a discipline to figure out who your customer is or like to keep that in the foreground always. In other words, whether it's the science community for a grant or whether it's uh, Joe Voter, yeah, yeah, or yeah, well, no. climate bill, or it, it seems like that's well, a th practice this is, that could cut through the maelstrom. Sure, sure. This is why um, the ABT is the central tool, the and but therefore, because it's not those three words and but therefore, it's the the three forces of narrative that they embody, and those three forces are agreement, contradiction, and consequence. And those three forces are not anything that I discovered. Those three forces, guess what? Three to 400 years ago, the philosophers, Kant and Hegel and all of them, they discovered them, the triad of thesis, antithesis, synthesis. This is how the brain is programmed. And the psychology world has gotten so caught up in multi-levels of gobbledygook that people can no longer see the forest for the trees. And this idea of simplicity is just dismissed as, oh, well, you're an idiot. You don't understand all the sophisticated stuff we're doing. For which, by the way, you know, you look in, yesterday I had on my podcast, um, a cognitive psychologist Marianne Gary from uh, New Zealand, who's tremendous and works on false memories. And, you know, we talked about the whole world of psychology is just a wash in all these counter interpretations and theories and everything else like that. They've built so many multi levels that they're off debating things up in the clouds um, that ends up being very hard for the practical real world. But the ABT uh, is, is the starting point. It's these three forces, agreement, contradiction, consequence. And what you see when you look at those three forces, what's the first thing there? It's agreement. That's what you're talking about. Everything begins with agreement. And then you begin to look deeper and you see my old buddy, Jerry Graff, who was in my movie, Flock of Dodos, by coincidence, um, published this book with his wife, They Say, I Say. And mm -hmm. this book, The Moves That Matter in Academic Writing, has sold over 2 million copies. It is used wow. in humanities all across the country. And I've had undergraduates, you know, contact me that say they've had this book in three courses. And look at the title there. They say, I say, all that is is and but. It's the exact same right. thing, the three forces. They say this, and they title it this because this is the quintessential stereotypical template for a good argument. You know, all else equal. If you're going to jump into an argument, this is the best way to begin. You begin by stating what we can all agree upon. They say, okay, for 100 years, they, meaning all of us, have always said this. But 
I say this and what they left off is the third element, which is therefore the synthesis together. Right. And that's where this stuff is so infinitely deep. And that's the joy and the fun of running this course is that as soon as people start to grasp this three-part structure, this tripartite structure, they begin seeing it all around them. And then in the world of storytelling and screenwriting, so far, there is one little great book written in the UK by John York, a BBC producer in 2014 called Into the Woods. And in there, in just a few sentences, he talked about the fractal nature of storytelling. And he said, stories are made up of these multiple levels that all have this tripartite structure. Well, that tripartite structure is the ABT. That's what it is. That's how we tell so stories. Like the chapters in a thriller. Totally. Yep. And the, the example I always uh, use, Breaking Bad, you know, the TV show Breaking Bad, one of the great yeah. exercises in, in, tele, in writing for television. And yeah. five seasons of that, the whole show had an ABT. Every season had an ABT. Every character's got an ABT. Every episode, every scene. Layering, 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 layering of ABTs. And the term that I came up for it is nested ABTs. Now, interestingly, in 2018, Oprah Winfrey gave this tremendous Golden Globe speech and overnight was hailed as a masterpiece. A friend sent it to me and said, does this thing embody your ABT stuff? And I instantly I did a blog post that, yes, look, here's classic nested ABT. The next day, the New York Times wrote their analysis and they came out with a much better term for my nerdy nested ABT in which they said it was an example of a story made of stories. And when I read that, I thought, I wish I'd put that in my Houston book, but you know, sometimes I'm still a little back in the science analytical world, but that's what it's about. That's what you want to do is tell a story made of stories. And that's what Oprah had done with that tremendous speech. And that's what great communicators do. Yeah. So there's some really good questions and comments have come in. Um, let's see. Uh, Bob, got, here's a comment from all crap. <laughs> Here's Bob Schloss uh, from YouTube. He's, he says, what Randy is saying is bring the message to where the people are in the format they enjoy rather than bring the audience to you, the scientists. So that feels like it resonates pretty much. Yeah. You know what? I, I had a little um, article in Scientific American last year that unfortunately got swallowed up by the pandemic because it came out in March, right when the pandemic hit. But the title was A New Tool for Humanizing Medicine. And what that was about was trying to get doctors trained and listening better and understanding that narrative structure begins with agreement. That first thing, that's what you do. You listen, listen, listen. That's why we have Brian Palermo in the course. He's a veteran improv actor and instructor, and that's his job in the course is to work with the people on this fundamental uh, starting point of listening. And if you can't start with listening, you ain't going to get anywhere fast. So he, here's kind of a but from him in a second comment. Uh, attention spans are measurably shorter amongst most people in 2021. They were in 1950. If our systems uh, distilling scientific insight for the public were refined in the 50s, we have a mismatch. <laughs> wait, no, wait, what do we mean there? If our systems... He means that, you know, if our, if our norms for scientific communication are based uh, on a half century old model yeah, yeah. and exactly. attention spans are only one of the things that's changed, uh, Again, those polarizing um, algorithms are, are there too. There well, was me, a, okay. Actually, let me just show you on, on Twitter. This is kind mm -hmm. of related. Uh, you know, the, the new information environment has other dimensions. And here, uh, uh, I'm not sure what his actual name is, Dr. Strange, uh, riffing off of McLuhan, the McLuhan comment says, analysis of our information maelstrom that doesn't take into account the development of bad digital actors is a fail. So, uh, you know, how does that, added layer um, that the system is programmed. Actually, the system is programmed okay, 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 to- Wait wait a second, I'll stop it right there. Yeah. Who, who's a bad Who's a bad digital actor? You know, what's Well, the I would say Facebook historically no, and what- bad, di bad digital actor in your definition is people whose facts don't match your facts and vice versa. And here's the rotten thing that people on the left don't even want to listen to is last year on Meet the Press, Rudy Giuliani basically said, the truth is no longer the truth. And that's the truth. There's your information maelstrom where the information is so flowing right. everywhere. Nobody can figure out what is the truth anymore. Who do you listen to? And there's a way to make that still work, which is to get that singular voice. This is what Osterholm had complained about on Meet the Press a year ago, which is we're failing to find a single voice. And here's the failure of the entire science community, which was 15 years ago. You know, I made Flock of Dodos because an article came out in the New Yorker titled De-Evolution. And when I read that article, that was when the alarm bells went off for me. I had been a graduate student in the early 80s. I sat there in Stephen Jay Gould's 
office. Uh, he had a Tuesday lunch group that I was part of for the first couple of years. And there was a pillar in the center of his office that he would get these periodically, get these uh, hilarious letters from creationists telling him that he was going to go to hell for believing in evolution. And they were also innocuous and silly. And he'd read them to the group. and We'd all roar with laughter and he'd scotch tape it up on the pillar. And it was kind of festooned with all these cockamamie letters. That's as deep as I ever thought this anti-science stuff was until 2005 when I read that article in the New Yorker de-evolution. And in an instant, like, what, what are you telling me here? There's this thing, the Discovery Institute in Seattle that is pouring millions of dollars into this campaign to attack evolution. It, it wasn't like that in the 1980s. It got really serious. Well, as soon as it got serious, the whole science world should have sat up and said, and this is what, you know, Crichton and others were warning in the late 90s. His keynote speech to AAAS in 1999, it's in there verbatim. Basically, you better watch out. You know, your beloved profession of science is going to start having major problems with this internet thing as you start opening the doors to all your academic resources and giving your weapons over to your enemies to start assembling this anti-science agenda, which has come together. Well, in 2005, 6, 7, 8, by then the anti-soup movement was so large. And sadly, things like Al Gore's movie, you know, he dismissed it in an instant. He cited Naomi Oreskes paper from science saying, look, there's all these papers that are pro science. And you know how many of those support the anti-science movement? Zero. Uh, therefore, let's not even worry about them. What he should have been doing was sounding the alarm right then. And furthermore, the science world should have sat up and they should have addressed the question of what are we going to do as a science community if this country ever elects an anti-science president? We need to put together a contingency plan for communication, because if we get an anti-science president, we're going to have a hell of a mess here because the most authoritative voice in the country is going to start pronouncing these anti-science things. How are we going to compete against that voice? We better have some contingency plan, some place out in Colorado, a bunker where the best voices of science can get together and issue a singular competing voice to go against that. But there was none of that planning whatsoever. And then this country did elect a president who, number one, took us out of the Paris Accord. And then by the end of his term was talking about injecting yourself with bleach and furthermore, co-opting the singular voice for the biomedical community, Anthony Fauci, and having him up on the stage with him that just messed up that voice as well. So it has been a communications nightmare and a failure to anticipate any of this sort of stuff. And at the core of all of that is an absence of innovation. And that's what we're talking about, getting back to that sort of comment that um, the science world is very conservative by its own nature. That's a lot of why I left my career as a scientist, even though I'd gotten tenure and was all set to do that for the rest of the time. I didn't want to beat my head against the wall in a profession yeah. that was innovation. And that's what's been missing with this pandemic is that they jumped into a ton of innovation to try and figure out the, the vaccines. And, you know, Michael Lewis wrote that book on uh, premonition where he really told the story of seven of these brave people that were part of all that innovation they were doing to create the vaccines. But there was none of that on the communication side. And I know this from talking to people that were on the inside. They just brought in the same old communicators, do the same old thing, get the facts, get them out to the public. Why was there no innovation? Why was there no experimentation? Why was there no broadening out? Like, let's think of some unique ways to try and get it to these communities that we have reason to believe are going to be resistant. But I haven't read of any innovative projects to try and break through on that. And that's the way you do make breakthroughs. You don't know what How the much answer of this, is. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, when you talk about innovation, a lot, a lot of people, a lot of my friends in the news business, for example, think about infographics or, or Which, some new interactive <laughs> data tool. Um, I think it's worth reminding people that I think, and tell me if I'm wrong, that your sense of innovation is more about literally how you speak, how you present, how you my, my, you know, connect with audiences, choose I audiences. Have, and connect I have with a audiences. very simple brain. You know, I'm not capable of very deep thoughts, um, but that brain was programmed by some very powerful people early on, uh, one of whom was Stephen Jay Gould. And I was a teaching fellow twice in the intro bio course. And one of the things he would say over and over and over again because he understood the power of inculcation and, and iteration was he would talk about natural selection and selection in general. And he would say, look, it is a simple two-step mechanism. That's all there is to it. Mostly it is two steps. Step one is non-directional. It's random variation. That's the raw material for the process to work on. And then second two is uh, step two is highly deterministic. It's the environment coming along and selecting for a certain pattern, but it's that ratcheting over and over again, of variation and then the deterministic part. And that's the same thing as creativity. And so you want to solve a problem. You've got to be generating that random variation early on. You've got to have this ideation. You've got to, the people in, in the design world know this, you know, companies like IDEO and rapid prototyping, all that sort of stuff. 
they know this religiously. This is how you have to do it. You've got to begin with these brainstorming sessions where everything's fair game. Then you set to work with the critical part of it. But the science world so values this critical side that they constrain the variation. And so there just isn't creativity that goes on. And that's what you see for this pandemic. You see an complete, utter and complete absence of creativity in the communication of it, including where was the Hollywood voice from the very beginning? You know, we know from previous crises, there are people in Hollywood, there are celebrities that can be brought into this sort of stuff. This is what I worked with on, with Osterholm was trying to find some celebrity voices to get behind the, the issues. What? And there just was none of that. Yeah. And one thing that I would love, and I, I used to talk to the Aldo Leopold people about this too. Um, I remember, I think I spoke at Ohio University once, probably 10 or 15 years ago, and uh, young PhD students there were craving kind of a... Um, Aldo Leopold uh, franchise. Like, how can we just do this ourselves? How can we build the capacity among us to, as young scholars, to to test ways to talk more effectively, to find to find messages, not not just messages, but to find ways to engage with people. And I still don't see that, except perhaps through what you're doing. Is there a way to spread the joy? And the, I'm going to give you a, a, a rationale for it. Yeah, uh, I was in Maine. I'm going to Maine a lot because uh, my wife's family's from there. And I was up there recently and I ran, I, I just was in the car and on was the live presentation by, by uh, Maine's um, Dr. Shah, uh, Nirav Shah, who was their, you know, health department, state health department guy. And I talked to my 89 year old mother-in-law living in a very resistant, vaccine resistant part of Maine. And she said, oh yeah, Dr. Shah, everyone loves Dr. Shah. Yeah. And he, he, so I was tweeting about it live from the car, you know, I just kind of stopped and here he was. And everyone loves Dr. Shaw in Maine. And it's yeah. different than Fauci. It didn't have, I don't think I've seen any of that toxicity around him. So imagine if what's the what's the information environment or the training environment that can have people in positions? You, you know, you're doing this great work like with the Park Service and NIH and others. What would success look like to see this to spread that joy or to spread that capacity? So there's more Dr. Shaw's. Well, in my case, I'm being pulled in the, into the business world. And if you search now ABT narrative marketing, you'll find dozens and dozens of websites in the business world that are all now using the ABT template. And they, a few months ago, um, last spring, I was on a podcast in Spain with a guy over there who'd come across in the business world that and he interviewed me. And then like a week later, I got contacted from a, a podcast guy in the UK and we had a long chat. And this guy's also from the business world. And he said, you know, all of my friends here, we've all been using this ABT template. It's so powerful in marketing and sales and branding and communication. We love it. We just never knew where it came from. We were always, you know, we'd always say to each other, where did this thing come from? For like three years, they've been using it. And then they finally heard me on this guy's podcast in Spain. Like, oh, that's the guy. And that's why he got in touch with me. And so Park Howell is out there just propagating the hell out of it in the business world. And I am now talking to a few major corporations that I don't want to go into details on. But, you know, I turned 66 two weeks ago. I've had it in some ways with the science world. If they didn't want what I developed, then I'll take it somewhere else. And I'm taking it there. I'm taking it to the legal world. The book that, that Doug and I are doing for law is, you know, yeah. he's on fire over the ABT. And we're just all these other disciplines, the humanities people get this thing. The science world is so... I wrote about it. And then don't be such a yeah. scientist. Second chapter, don't be so literal minded. They are so programmed for negation that they chew good things up and spit them back out. And they're just handicapped that way. They're their own worst enemies. And I don't know what to say beyond that, which is they're welcome to negate me and dismiss me and say, oh, he washed out. You know, he, he's a ne'er do well. He's a malcontent, all those sorts of things. That, a lot of the people, that's the narrative they're trained with. Um Back when I was first as an undergraduate at the University of Washington, I remember hearing this term sour grapes. I'd never heard it before from the graduate students and professors. And I began to realize that's the term you use as a scientist to anybody who turns and criticizes the science establishment. You instantly hit them with, oh, sour grapes. That guy's just not getting enough grants funded. And so he's bitter. So you can never mm -hmm. critique the science establishment. They've got this mechanism built in to discredit you and dismiss you. And I'm sure that's a lot of what Crichton went through, you know, as soon as he tried to offer up these cautionary tales. You know, a lot of the science people just don't want to hear it. And so they've got mechanisms built in. So I'm not going to kill myself. I'm 66. I'm really, really busy with tennis and surfing. And those are my highest yeah. priorities. And, you know, I'm just not going to engage in this stuff anymore and sit around miserable during the day because people have written rotten reviews of my movie because it didn't fit their vision of how 
science should be presented in this one dimensional informational thing that doesn't work. Can, can we go a little bit past the hour? Cause there's a couple more questions yeah, I want to ask yeah, yeah. you. Yeah, I got, I got uh, nothing on my schedule except for tennis in a while. So <laughs> awesome. Well, one of them is, um, well, environmental groups also, this was, this was, this was the war between Crichton and the, you know, the state of fear that last yeah, novel, yeah. uh, yeah. It was all about them creating false narratives. Well, let, let me begin. We're powerful here. and, you know. Okay, so here, here was my history with Crichton, which was 30 years ago in the very first film festival award that I ever got. Um, I met a guy there who was Crichton's collaborator, Michael Backus. He wrote the screenplay for Rising Sun. He worked with Crichton on a ton of things and yada, yada, yada for about 10, 15 years. He was his closest confidant. So through and I'm still best buddies with Mike. We just went to a Dodgers game a few weeks ago. Um, and through him, I've learned so much of the personal side of the journey of Michael Crichton and what he got subjected to, all those sorts of things. And finally, in 2007, when I was making Sizzle, that was when Mike introduced me through email. I never did meet Crichton in person, but we began this correspondence and email. And the first email he sent me he said, I got to begin by warning you here. I may be the most cynical human on this planet. Um, and that's the point he'd gotten to, you know, which was F right. these people, F the system, F humanity. And wouldn't you get there too, after 25 years of offering yourself up of writing these essays and things, so much yeah. knowledge and squandered, but science world doesn't want to hear those stories, you know? So what can you do? Right. It's, yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, and environmental groups, um, 10 years ago, I think it was George Monbiot, the British columnist, wrote a piece yes. drawing on a guy. He was drawing on the work of a, a British environmental activist who said the environmental movement had completely failed to take up marketing, take up the oh, oh, fundamental well, that's the Christoph, things that's you the, talk about. Um, yeah, that's the Nicholas Kristof article in Outside, which again, yeah. why wasn't that article held up as the mantra, the whole science, the whole environmental world you don't need these big fat books. It's right there in three pages of Nicholas Kristof thing. That's the subtitle, the title of his article. Everybody, you know, can you search that and put that in your, your chat thing yeah. there? I mean, he hit the right. nail on the head with that article. It's so brilliant. And we still use it over and over again. There's not a lot of knowledge you need for this stuff to communicate effectively. And in there, he cites the work of Paul Slovak. I think his name from University of Oregon. Oh, Paul Slovak's a genius. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. On his yeah. for a long time. Well, the problem is that a lot of those people in social psychology and psychology and probably even him, they produce so much volume of stuff and only a few tidbits are really, really valuable. But he plucked out the one on the singular narrative and I use it endlessly in the course. Um, and, you know, and by the way, you know, can you scroll back up there to that photo? <laughs> the, Oops, Nicholas Kristof in this article draws on the knowledge that he and his wife gained in working in Africa for all these years. And he uses as a, as an example, um, African American or no African children in there. And so then in one round of our course, I made a mention of that and then used this photo. And all of a sudden one person started calling me racist for, you know, there it is. I'm just, it, it came to mind oh. looking at this. How can you win nowadays? You know, oh, well, you're using this, you're tokenizing Africans, blah, blah, blah. Oh, you can't win. But well, everyone's trying to impose a narrative, their narrative yeah, on. There it is. In there it is. Fortunately, you know what? That person put one comment in the chat window and said, how does everybody else feel about this? And the other 29 people just sat their silence like, you know, we're not joining in yeah. on that. Come on. We're here to do some work. Um, but this article is so good. And there you go. But it's it should have been a book. And look at the subtitle. What would isn't that the same thing you were just saying that Monbiot had said? And he's he's really great as well. Uh, what would happen? What would happen if, if aid organizations and other philanthropists embrace the dark arts of marketing and psychological persuasion on Madison Avenue? Exactly. You know, I'll I'll send you a post afterwards the uh, piece the this manifesto from a decade ago that was. It says. Oh, oh, the other thing it said is that what people miss about what happens in advertising. Is they're not selling the car, they're selling the oh, vibe. Yeah, they're the vibe selling. Exactly. Yes, they're yeah. selling a lifestyle or a um, a way of being. Yeah. And, well, that, and I think that too is something. Yeah, yeah, that, that was. You the know, way. if it's all woe is me, and you know us and yes. them. If well, it's all, so you know, good guy, bad guy. That was the profound thing that that um, Park Howell brought to our course 
which is the hero's journey. So now everybody's gotten tapped into the hero's journey and they think that it's some magical formula that helps you, you know, hypnotize people or whatever. And what Park has said from the beginning is the mistake. And he works with a lot of small businesses. And what the small businesses will do is try and use the hero's journey to tell the story about how they're, they're the hero saving the world with their product, yada, yada, yada. And Park's point is that you're not the hero. In the, in the hero's journey, your customer is the person who's on this journey and you're the mentor. You're the person off to the side, the guide who's trying to just whisper some advice. You know, here's the kind of clothes you want to wear and we can bring them to you. But you're not the hero. And that's a reverse mindset. Right. And that is the same thing you find with the ABT, which is to, to start off the ABT with the and part, with the listening is really tough. It's counterintuitive. One of the great little examples that I use over and over again in the course is what went on in the state of North Dakota in 2014. So my good buddy, Rick Nelson, who's retired now from Fish and Wildlife there, brought me there in 2014. The state of North Dakota spent, or environmental groups, spent $4 million in 2014 backing this initiative there for the state of North Dakota to give 5% of their oil and gas revenues to conservation issues. And they threw all these resources in there. They hired these three PR firms from New York, Washington, D.C., and San Francisco to come to the state. All these young hipster folks from urban environments who did not know the first thing about the people of North Dakota. They came in there, put together a hopelessly misguided $4 million mass media campaign. It failed. It didn't just fail. It lost 80-20. When the, their state legislature came back, back in, they took put together a vendetta against any uh, politicians that got behind the thing. So they punished the people even for getting behind this thing. And then Rick brought me there with a the camera crew to spend a week driving around the state doing a listening tour and what we found when we listened was the majority of people in the state said, we don't have a problem here. We got, we're overrun with wildlife. We got more ducks than we know what to do with. We got deer running everywhere. Why do we need to spend this money that we could use on schools and everything else on conservation issues? Well, the environmental groups had bypassed the and, and, and stuff. They'd gone right to the butt. You know, you got a problem here. Your conservation's failing. Therefore, we've got a whole package of solutions. Nobody wanted the solutions. Why would you bring solutions to a community that didn't ask for them? That's what happens a lot with the environmental movement. You get these heavily educated folks that have thought out their grand solution thing. They failed to understand that it all begins by creating a little bit of a groundswell of having listened to the people and what they feel is important. Uh, one other thing I wanted to touch you touch on with you um, yeah. is Trump. He's oh, uh, boy. Uh, Jay, Rose, Jay Rosen at NYU. I had him on my show early yep. in the pandemic yep. and I had him on again. And he said the media had failed completely to go into what he called emergency mode, that this is beyond. He says, she says, that's not even sufficient part of the landscape of problems the press faced in covering Trump, uh, yeah. who was, as you had written many times, was a master. Yes. AB, his ABT uh, score was really high. So how, how much of what would be needed in an ideal world is, a, is an awareness of these concepts in audiences so you can identify false narratives or can, so you recognize not only, in this case, we're talking mainly about presenters of information, you know, catching the right people. But, you know, but how much of this is also works the other way? And, and I'm just going to give you one more visual reference before you yeah, yeah. respond. I... I, I you know, I've, I've talked about narrative capture. Beware of narratives because they, if, they, if they're too comfy, that means you're being sucked into something without thinking about it. And I, I, I talk about um, Ikea. is essentially, there you can see, uh, Ikea draws you through their store. They've captured you with a narrative, buffeting you with fractal narratives along the way. Buy this, buy this. So, so how much of what the world would need ideally is also just an understanding of this basic concept so that you can recognize the negative narrative too. Is that part of it in your head? I'm afraid we're mostly just in a world of competition and you've just got to be the better yeah. communicator. And that's the problem. And people don't understand yeah. how, well, they don't understand how hard narrative structure is. And that's the thing that's being missed. Oh, we need to tell stories, telling stories, talk to the people in Hollywood. They have a century of understanding how hard this stuff is. And you've got to prioritize it. You've got to put a ton of resources into it and figure out. And there is an, an objective way to come about doing it. You know, it's not about touchy feely stories. It's at the core. This is the hardest part. You know, where do you think I got the ABT from? I got it from the co uh, South Park co-creators. 
Matt Stone and Trey right. Parker, they talked about it in a documentary and they said, every week we hit our moment where we do our rule of replacing, where we look at our script and every time we encounter the word and we ask ourselves, can we place, replace it with a butter? Therefore, when I heard that, I fell out of my chair. I began researching it. My buddy, Marty Kaplan from the Norman Lear Center at USC eventually sent me a copy of a speech from Frank Danielle, the brilliant and legendary screenwriting instructor at USA that I was lucky enough to have his course the year before he passed away. And in 1986, he gave a speech where he pinpointed these three words. And he said, the first paragraph is in, in his speech, this two parts, he said, whenever we write first drafts, we fall into the dreaded and then, and then, and then structure. It is in the revisions that we begin to replace those and thens with the buts and the therefores that make for the turns that activate the brain, basically. He didn't use that language, but that's what Yuri Hassan's work at, in neurophysiology at, at Princeton shows you is that when you hit that contradiction moment, that's when the brain lights up. That's when you pull the audience. That's the word. But by the way, my buddy, Mike Backus, you know, I mentioned the former um, professional partner with Michael Crichton. And Mike's now one of the world's top authorities on medical marijuana. His, his book, Cannabis Pharmacy, is mm -hmm. enormously popular, over a thousand reviews on Amazon. And he told me recently that now he, he's come to realize that this word, but is probably the most powerful word in the English language. Same thing that Jerry Graff wrote to me <laughs> a year ago. Same deal. He was reading an editorial and it was beginning to hit him. Well, wait a second. This word, but it's on a day-to-day -day basis, the most powerful word. And what Bacchus tells me is nowadays when he does a press conference or an interview or Q&A, if he starts to get the least bit lost in what he's saying, all he has to do is say the word but, and everybody will look up. You cannot end a sentence on the word but. But. Right. It, it instantly activates the brains. But what? But where are we going next now? That's the power of contradiction. And then you start to look at all these conspiracy theories and you see how much contradiction is involved in sp conspiracy theories. There is a deeper science that nobody's begun to scratch the surface on, which is these three forces of agreement, contradiction, and consequence. And it, it's, you know, it's a conundrum because you kind of have to have an intuitive feel for how these three forces are important before you begin to believe yourself that they're important. There it is. Yeah, exactly. And, right. you know, that's an early version of the framework. We've now resolved all kinds of other little dynamics in there. Most important, mm -hmm. which I think, is the if-then clause. And it turns out if then, and yeah, you kind of have to take the course at that point or, or get the, the narrative. That's jumbo. good. Yeah. If then is incredible. Well, yeah. Well, this is a good place to, to, to pause. I'd say, you know, um, I, every time we talk, new ideas pop up. And uh, I think one of the things that's most valuable about your current framing, including the word gym narrative is, is it's, it's a process. It's a practice. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. like yoga, meditation, karate, all the things I don't do enough of, and <laughs> it, it only comes through repeated, uh, iterative, um, responsive that's it. effort, and yeah, that's mm -hmm. it's a journey. <laughs> it's it, so it, it's yeah. never you're, you're you're never done. I think that's of course, especially in a, in, a, in an evolving communication landscape, you're absolutely never done because if you're not aware of the uh, changing patterns. Yeah. You. But the other thing you said that I think is so valuable, again, if you're in an inf information maelstrom, a key first step is listening for the voices or identifying the parts of it that matter to whatever it is you're working on and avoiding the stuff that's just noise. Uh, another guy at Columbia in the, the National Center for Disaster Preparedness, Jeff Schlegelmilch, early in the pandemic, he gave this unbelievably great advice on his Facebook page to like friends and family that I had him come on the show. And it was basically, he said, people, including decision makers, quite often when something, there's an emergency, people just want more and more information. What they're missing is they, you want less and less information. Yes. yes. You want to, you want to cut through it. You want to, what is actionable, you know? And the, so that his, his sense of listening and your sense of providing both come together in this possibility of change. And I think it's really great that you're doing what you're doing. And you've been keeping <laughs> well, at it despite your, despite your having reached the, the, the tender age we're both at. I'm, I'm just a few months. Well, you know what? I, I did a fairly crazy thing in my entire life's journey, which is at age 38, I reset the clock on my life. And so I walked away from a tenured professorship at age 38 and entered into film school at USC in a class of 50 students, almost all of whom were age 21. 
22 just recent college graduates. And that was fairly daunting for a while and massively humiliating for a long time. Although I always did it with a sense of humor, you know, and even the worst meetings in Hollywood where major agents and producers would just shit on me. I would just sit there with this little kind of perspective outside of my head, watching the scene, just roaring with laughter. Like, Oh my God, this is the stereotypical stuff I heard about in Hollywood. I I'm getting a dose of it now. They're crapping on everything I have to say. Um, so it's been a super fun journey, but the thing that is amazing right now with this course that we had no idea, it's the course that's really turned into a huge amount of fun. And we, this is the 17th iteration. I say to the, the classes now, you'd think after 17 times in just a year and a half, we'd be getting worn out. And it's the exact opposite. We're on this kind of exponential thing where it's more fun than ever because it's additive. And as we got a better handle on it, we these things just open up. We see, oh my God, look at this if then clause. Look at where it fits into this stuff on a weekly basis. Look at the what, how dynamic. Look at the Dobjansky, how it matches this. We're building this whole body of knowledge and all these people are getting use out of it in the business world now, not quite as much in the science world. And it's looking like that's the way I'm going to drift into more into business and law where it's fun. And who wants to beat their head against the wall and a brick wall for, you know, the rest of time. Uh, that's well, hopefully that. there's a few out there who come uh, attend your narrative gym. So uh, oh, yeah. again, thanks Randy Olson for Always being, great uh, coming back on sustain what, and sharing your hard earned <laughs> wisdom and even some of the bitterness and a lot of the creativity. So um, let's go forth. You get out into the world. Well, you know, you're, you're my number one favorite journalist over time and you've got such an open yeah. mind and you're, you're, you've always been seeking the truth. You know, you're not driven by some agenda or anything like that. That's why it's always been fun working with you for 20 years now, all the way back to shifting baseline stuff. So I Racky. really, really appreciate the journalistic principles that you bring to what you do. And let's hope it's a Dodgers Red Sox uh, World Series. That would be awesome. <laughs> All right. Ahead. Thanks, Randy. Uh, and right everybody, to... uh, get to the gym and do some working out. Uh, we will do more on this. Cool. Stay well.